Hi, everyone. Um, so welcome to Edinburgh, first of all. Um, as the Richard mentioned, I'm on my final year of PhD at the University of Edinburgh. My name is Shirin, and today I'm going to be talking to you about something I had um, kind of briefly proposed in uh, Iceland a couple of years ago. Um, what is the impact of speaking two languages? What is the impact of being bilingual on the executive function skills of autistic children? And so this study specifically focuses on English Arabic children. Right, so we dive straight into with some definitions. So um, for those of you not familiar specifically with uh, the autism, um, it is a neurodiverse condition. So for any of you that are not familiar with the neurodiversity movement, it is basically the understanding that human beings don't come in a one-size-fits-all neurologically normal package. Um, we have neurological di um, differences between us, and um, this condition is a prime example of that. Um, so basically, autism affects each individual very differently. So traditionally speaking, it is characterized by difficulties in social interaction, difficulties in communication, and the presence of restricted and repetitive uh, behaviors. Um, but just like any other type of human variation, those differences are recognized and respected for what they are. Right, so diving into executive function. So what is it? So it's basically a group of really important mental skills that allow us to set goals in our lives and just basically get things done. Um, there are several components of executive function. It's a really, really complex phenomena. But if I'm going to zoom in on four that are very key um, to this definition, I would say the first one would be working memory, which is basically the ability to keep information in mind. Sustained attention, the ability to focus over, over a period of time. Interference control, the amazing ability to resist distractions. And flexible switching, which is the ability to switch your thinking from one concept to another. So if I was going to give you an example of something that would require you to use all four at once, it would be learning how to drive, for example. But we tend to think of executive functions when things go wrong. So for example, um, you know, have you ever like poured orange juice into your cereal instead of milk? Or have you ever thought about stopping um, at the supermarket on the way back home, but instead you drive all the way back home without ever having actually made that stop? So people sometimes can refer to those situations as like, my head was in the clouds, or I was absent-minded. But what's actually happening here, what we're really experiencing, is a, um, is a lapse in your executive function. So how big of a deal is it? Huge, because it, I mean, this is something that we use in every, um, every single day, in all aspects of our lives. Um, and over the past, um, I mean, several years, really, like even maybe three decades, researchers have provided evidence to show that executive function has um, been shown to predict things like social skills, your academic achievement, mental health, physical health, your quality of life, and even staying out of jail. Um, so zooming into the bit of background which interests me, so there's evidence that suggests that certain executive function skills could be impaired in autistic children. Um, there's also evidence, some evidence, because there is a big debate here, that the regu regularly speaking two languages could extend or could improve those same executive function skills that are somewhat impaired in children with autism. But there's so much that we don't know about the impact of bilingualism on the executive function abilities of children with autism. And because there's insufficient evidence to support any language decisions for children with autism, it becomes quite critical to investigate at this interface. So you need to keep in mind that um, worldwide, there seems to be this general advice given to um, speech language therapists or even by speech language the therapists to families of children with autism to caretakers that you should only speak one language with an autistic child. Um, there are concerns or fear that two languages might confuse them or it might overtax their linguistic system. Um, at the end of the day, these notions are not evidence-based, but they continue to rule um, worldwide and affects obviously treatment, education, employment, your identity. I mean, language is key to all of those things. So I had asked this in Polyglot a couple of years ago, but just... Um, I think it definitely stands um, as a question for today. So at the interface of bilingualism, autism, and executive function, just by show of hands, how many of you think we have about like more than 30 studies at this interface? Okay, how many of you think we have like 10 to 20 studies? All right. How many of you think we have less than five? You are correct. And um, yeah, so 
it's a relatively new wave of research. It's at its infancy, which brings me straight into, now I can dive into the research study that we proposed. So what's particularly different about this study? This is the first investigation at the interface of bilingualism, autism, and executive function to focus on Arabic-speaking populations. So Arabic is the fifth most spoken language um, in the world with over 240 million native speakers. It is also the first investigation at this interface to include sustained attention as an executive function, like as an independent executive function process. So the few studies that have been done on this interface tend to focus on things like flexible switching, interference control, and working memory, or a combination of all three. It's the first investigation at this interface to collaborate with 20 plus organizations. So it's, it's just, it's a little unusual because we had about a year to collect the data. So we had to, um, it was a real privilege to um, be accepted by so many organizations for research participation. So it's nationwide recruitment um, across three cities within a year of data collection. And finally, this study included a very large variety of ethnicities and nationalities. Less than 10% of the country where I collected data um, has a population that are actually citizens of that country. Can anyone guess what that country might be? Less than 10% of that country's population are citizens of that country. Yeah, good job. Yeah, exactly. So seven rulers, each signifying the seven emirates. United, they formed the United Arab Emirates. So our data collection took place in three cities, Abu Dhabi, Dubai, and Sharjah. Now, bear with me for a second. So this is basically the, you know, there are many theories have been proposed to explain the relationship between bilingualism and executive function. Like, why would speaking two languages help your executive function in the first place? So bilinguals, you know, they tend to do these things like switch between their languages or inhibit one language so that they can speak another language. So they are, you know, the theoretically ex exercising those domains. Um, but there's a specific theory that we are looking to test in this study, and it's called the Adaptive Control Hypothesis. It's by Abu Ta Green and Abu Talibi. So basically what this hypothesis says is that the um, effect of language and executive function, so the impact of language on executive function depends on the language context. So what's the context that this, that this is taking place in. So he identified, they identified three different contexts, something called a single language switching context. So there's actually no switching taking place here. It's like I'm speaking here with Richard, for example, in Arabic, and then I go home and I speak in English. So I'm using two different languages in two separate different contexts. There's no switching taking place within that one context. The second type of environment or context is called dual language switching. In dual language switching, I'm switching between English and Arabic in the same context, but it could be with different speakers. That is exactly the type of context that they propose will impact these four executive function areas. So in that type of the context, we can expect bilingualism to theoretically advantage those areas. The last type of context is a little creepy because it does involve you changing words from one language to kind of fit another. So it's called dense language switching. So it would be, for example, if I wanted to say my mood in Arabic, but keeping in mind the dense language switching context, I would just say moody. So mood is English, the Y is just in Arabic, just refers back to the person who's saying it. So that's an example of that. It's not to say that the UAE doesn't, doesn't have examples of that, it's just the dominant language switching context is the dual language switching. And so that's the interaction, that is the hypothesis that we're looking to, um, that's the model that we're looking to test. And so based on that, we have two key hypotheses. The first hypothesis is that we do expect on a di on a diagnostic level, we expect that typically developing children will outperform autistic children on these domains. The second hypothesis is that bilingual children with autism will outperform monolingual children with autism. Again, we're testing this particular model. Right, so zooming in on our sample. So we had about, we had 93 children. Um, their mean age is about nine years old. They were matched on six factors. So the first factor is relating to their um, nonverbal IQ. So we recruited children who were, say, more cognitively abled, um, kind of fell into the intellectually average uh, spectrum of the measure that we use for nonverbal IQ. We also matched them on socioeconomic status um, quite rigorously, actually. We had four different ways to look at socioeconomic economic status, so there's paternal edu education level. There's also the number of years, um, paternally speaking. Same thing with the, with the mothers, the level of education, so whatever, high school, college, so on, and also the number of continuous years that they were in education. 
Um, this is just a breakdown of the ethnicities, sorry, the nationalities that we had in the study. So they were predominantly Arab, followed by white, followed by Asian, and then other sub-nationalities there as well. Right, results time. Okay, so I'm just going to walk you through the um, different type of types of tasks that we used, right? So um, th it was a really difficult task because, again, most of the tasks we're getting our hands on are typically used with typically developing children. They're not necessarily, um, you know, uh, modified to accommodate any different types of processing. Um, but this is, this is an example of one such task. It's called the psychomotor vigilance task. So this is specifically, this we specifically use to measure sustained attention. Basically, children are seated in front of a computer. By the way, all the tasks were com computerized. Um, they basically saw an empty circle, which is what you see here up there. Suddenly, the circle starts to fill in red. Their job is to press a specific key, which is like the space bar, as soon as that circle starts to fill in red. And so when they do, their reaction time comes up on the screen. So say that child clicked in 428 milliseconds. Um, there are three outcome variables here. We've chosen to focus on two that we think are um, strongly associated with sustained attention. So one of them is just your mean reaction time. So how quickly are you pressing as soon as you see that red circle? The other one is something called false starts. So it is the number of times you pressed too quickly. So it's the number of times you pressed without the circle turning into red. Um, and those were the two outcome variables that we're going to be looking at. Right. So basically, uh, just to have a quick look here at these graphs. Um, so if we have a look at the top one with the mean reaction time. So the green bars, the dark green and the light green, those represent the typically developing groups and the purple um, slash pink that represents the autistic groups. So you can see like from that graph is that typically developing children were faster in their reaction time. Um, but there were no, um, in terms of st statistically significant results, something important to keep in mind is that we applied the Bonferroni correction to all of our outcome variables. So basically what that is, um, you know, we just want to decrease the error rate here, something called the type 1 error. So you believing that there is a, um, an actual effect when in reality there isn't one. So we are comparing across multiple outcomes here. So we have two outcomes. So we just divided the traditional significance alpha, which is 0.5, so usually anything at below that level is significant, but we've had to adjust that to 0 0.02 because we're comparing across multiple outcomes here. Um, so on a diagnostic level, typically developing children were significantly faster um, than their autistic peers. But in terms of language group effect, we didn't find any statistical differences between bilinguals and monolinguals in both the TD group and the autistic group. Um, in terms of the interaction effect, um, so that would be the same thing. In terms of the false starts that we have here, so you'll notice actually that the autistic bilingual group actually did better than everyone here, um, certainly did better than their, 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 um, the monolingual peers, but in terms of findings, it was significant only at the 0.5 level, but when it was adjusted, it was not significant. So we can say that children performed equivalently regardless of their language status on this task, on sustained attention. The next measure that we use is something called the Simon task. So this is specifically tapping into your interference control, uh, your ability to resist distraction. So children, again, once again, the same screen, the same computer, they um, are basically going to see two colors on the screen. They don't appear at the same time. So one time you see red, one time you see blue. In this case, you see red. Now, they are asked to press the right key if they see red and press the left key if they see blue. Um, and so if they, if they see um, red on the right and press the right key, that's a congruent condition. So that matches what they're supposed to press. If the red appears on the left and they press the right key, just because it's red, regardless of its d direction, that's an error. That's an incongruent condition. So they were basically presented with a series of trials of like red popping up on the page or blue popping up on, on the page. It, it would only appear right and left, right and left, right and left. So if you pressed red when it was right, great, awesome. If you pressed um, the right key when the red was on the left, that is an incorrect response. So children had to obviously resist the distraction because they had to resist the location, um, you know, like the fact that it was appearing left when they're supposed to press right. So it was actually a very tricky task for most of the kids that we had here. 
Once again, if we take a look at um, some of the outcome variables we have here, so we have three outcome variables. So it's the mean reaction time that they had on trials that matched the location and di direction of the key and trials that didn't, so that were incongruent. So generally speaking, you could see that typically developing children were faster than their autistic peers, but we didn't see any significant findings in terms of language group effect or an interaction effect. So once again, statistically significant differences between the two groups, autistic versus typically developing, but equivalent per performance between bilinguals and monolinguals. The third task that we have is flexible switching. So this is about, it's a task called dimensional change card sort task. So here children basically are asked to sort by one rule, sort by shape. And so they basically have this truck and this star, and now they're asked to sort by shape. So they'd need to drag that star to its star, and so that would be sorting by shape. And suddenly, after a few trials, we switch the rule. We tell them to match by color. And so now what they need to do is match that star to the truck now. A lot of children, especially younger children, have difficulty with this task. They continue to match based on the first rule, not the second rule. So this ability to switch, okay, now I have to sort by the second rule, um, that can be quite difficult for some children. Um, so this particular task, um, the first graph here, 1A, so that's just really showing you what's, um, there are different conditions of the task. There's the pre-switch phase, which is basically, I mean, so that's just sorting by the first rule. So there, ha there hasn't been a second rule introduced yet. Post-switch, so now the new rule has come into effect and now they need to switch. And then there's a mixed trial. So the mixed trial is the really tricky one because it's basically, you need to sort by color and shape, color and shape, color and shape. So they keep like mixing and matching these two. Um, what you notice basically, again, typically developing uh, the children um, had a significantly higher passing rate on the task. Um, in, in all the different outcomes, pre-switch, post-switch, and the mixed trials. Um, in terms of any um, language group effects, again here, even if we go down, so that you have the first outcome variable is with accuracy or your passing rate. The second outcome variable is like your reaction time. How fast were you when you were in the mixed condition only? So the mixed condition one is the one that we looked to analyze because it had a mix of trials, a mix of colors and shapes, colors and shapes. Um, so we wanted to see, like, what's the reaction time on that task? Again, typically developing children were faster, but no language group effects there. So bilinguals and the monolinguals performed equivalently. Um, same thing in the switch cost. Now, the switch cost data, again, typically developing the children had a lower switch cost, so it was less difficult for them to switch um, between the first rule and the second rule. The final executive function task that we have here is working memory. So in the working memory task, something called the self-ordered pointing task, children are basically presented with an array of images, but it comes in two different formats. There's an object version, the one you see now. There's a version um, of the same task, but also has abstract kind of images. So what children need to do, they need to click on each picture one time only and then press a new picture and then press a new picture until they complete all the pictures that are on the screen. So Let's just give you an example. On the first one, you touch the first one, you need to remember that and touch a new one. Re remember that and touch a new one until you're done with all the images in the array. Um, and it has different array sizes. So you start out with something like four, just to practice, goes all the way to 10 pictures that you need to remember. So results here show typically developing children, you see that green compared to the purple, um, is lower on the graph. So they made significantly less errors than their autistic peers. And surprisingly, actually, um, both kids, like typically developing groups and the autistic groups, made the highest number of errors in set size eight. So they made the highest errors when they had to remember eight pictures, not 10, surprisingly. Um, so basically, once again, the test showed sensitivity to um, detecting differences between the groups. Um, so typically developing the children were statistically, um, so they outperformed the autistic group, but no language differences that were statistically significant at the corrected alpha. So what does this mean? We tested out a model called the adaptive control hypothesis, which basically um, just kind of like sets this up really ideally, um, saying that if you are in a dual language switching context, you can expect these functions to be most impacted by an experience like bi bilingualism. Initially, there were three possible outcomes, right? So we could either find an advantage for bilinguals, we could find no advantage for bilinguals, um, which is actually still a big win for the autistic 
community. And the reason being, bilingualism had, has, had not shown a single disadvantage on any outcome variable for children with the autism. So they performed equivalently to their monolingual peers. Our findings, so we did not find evidence of any widespread executive function advantages associated with being bilingual in our sample. On the other hand, our data again make it very clear that bilingualism does not result in a disadvantage for autistic children. And those findings, you know, they join a growing body of the evidence, which is still again very young and very few. Um, they come together with a consensus that bilingualism does not negatively impact the executive functions of children with the autism. Um, autist so basically, autistic children who are part of a bilingual family or part of a bilingual society or the multilingual society should not be discouraged from learning a second language. There is no evidence to support the concerns um, that were voiced by parents and teachers that supports the policy worldwide, um, basically requesting um, families or even in some cases it's actually law to just give one language to autistic children, whether it's in schools or within their the programs, that is not evidence-based. Um, and so that's the main take home message of this uh, particular study, which is actually just part one of other studies that we're working on at the moment. Um, and in terms of future areas of research direction, I mean, this is an ocean, right? I mean, this is a very new wave of research. So much could be done here. But if there were like some take home messages, it would be number one, the autistic participants in our sample were more cognitively abled. So they were like um, in school inclusion, the programs, they had no intellectual delay. And um, they were proficient bilinguals. They were living in dual language contexts matched on six different factors. So it's important to think who can this generalize to. So we do need replication in um, different profiles of autistic th the children. Um, also, our sample size was quite limited. So even though um, basically all research at this interface should be considered preliminary and we need replication with larger sample sizes. We also need multiple measures of e executive function. So you can think of all the ways that executive function could be measured, right? And also the tasks that we use, they're kind of more like lab-based tasks. Like you wouldn't really administer, for example, something like that to a child in a real life daily context. So the inclusion of multiple measures, say if you wanted to look at, sus of, at sustained attention, you can look at it from the angle of two or more tasks, for example. And maybe they could be a mix of lab tasks and also tasks maybe with more ecological validity. Um, that's actually what we're doing for our second study, using more parent reports, teacher reports, so things that comment on how the child is doing in daily life in general. Keep in mind that the tasks, such tasks are administered at one point in time. So like I see you at 12, we finish at 12.20, this is your executive function score in those 20 minutes. We're not following up with any children like longitudinally. It's a, it's a one-time capture of your executive function performance. So that's really critical, is to do a combination of those measures and look at studies longitudinally. Um, and so this actually concludes the result of study one. Um, we're very pleased with that and we did not expect, I mean, we didn't really expect to find necessarily a disadvantage of being bilingual. We were hoping for either based on the, on the hypothesis that we had, based on the model that we were testing, bilinguals would do better on actually on both groups, typically developing an autistic group. We didn't find that widespread executive function advantage, but we found no advantage that bilingualism disadvantages children with autism in terms of their executive function. On that note, I just want to highlight and recognize and thank the 22 institutions that offered support at every single, you know, at any part of our um, recruitment uh, the process, whether they participated themselves or whether they just circulated the information. It led to 115 child participants and their families across three cities within 14 months. Um, definitely very grateful for that because I was doing it really just solo and I was a PhD student at the end of the day. So the fact that they offered the time and space to investigate something very new in a very short period of time is much appreciated. So I also wanted to thank um, the organizers of the language event in Edinburgh. Thank you for putting together this um, event. And I was just telling Richard it's um, not a very common opportunity to get to present, again, uh, research findings um, to kind of like 
a wider spectrum of the population. So sometimes it could be just like a bit too sciencey, but all like the scientific community. So it's great to be in a room where um, it's a mix of people really from all over the community. I also want to thank my supervisors, um, Dr. Sue the Fletcher Watson and Dr. Sarah Come McPherson um, for their excellent supervision on this work. And we're currently still working on other studies at this the interface. And I want to thank you all for taking the time to listen and come to Edinburgh. Welcome. Shukran. You might have already covered it in it. Did you, with the, the autistic groups that you had, did you mm -hmm. find there was a difference between high functioning autism and then like specifically Asperger's itself? or because they, so, they do present slightly differently sometimes and right. I just wondered whether there was like effects. Right. Based so on for this particular, it's a very good question, right? Because you're, uh, you're thinking of kind of like a more, um, maybe like a more diversified autism sample in terms of their cognitive ability or like intellectual functioning. So for this particular study, we narrowed it down only to children who had an intellectually average nonverbal IQ, so that's something like maybe 70 up. So we um, um, didn't incorporate kind of like more, I mean, we didn't look into the effects of, say, for example, um, I don't know if you just had about like 70 or 72 versus someone who's kind of like more, you know, on the upper end up that uh, spectrum. So no, we didn't look into that relationship. It is something that we're looking into into the second study, which is actually not just looking at between within the high functioning groups, because we're going to be looking at individual differences in performance. So that will show us if um, every single person on the um, in the autistic group, are they performing differently to the next person on the autistic group and so on and so on. So it's not something that we've looked at here, but it's a very Good question. Um, also, the next study we have will be more inclusive in terms of the intellectual um, uh, intellectual functioning kind of range. So we're taking even children that were below that range. So it could possibly even be children with an intellectual delay all the way up to to that level. So thank you for your question. Yes, I noticed on on quite a few of your uh, result graphs that your yes uh, statistical significance was. A pretty large variation. For example, I think one of the a few of the ones you might have just gone by there. Um, the same tension? Yeah. Um, mm, no. Let me give you another one. Is it this one? Yeah. Like for example, on this one here yeah. on the uh, autistic bilingual, there figure one B. Yeah. Why is that signif statistical significance such a large variation? Did you have a really yeah. really varied um, results from the kids, or is it just? Yeah. It's a great question. Yeah. So basically, do you know this task? Let me have a look at Yeah. So basically in this task, so you know how switch, switch cost is basically kind of like the difference from your post-switch condition to your, like, for, sorry, your pre-switch minus post-switching. So it's the difference between um, your switching in the pre-switching phase and your post-switching phase. So basically when you're doing this task, children had to use the touch screen feature of the laptop. So they would drag, so say they had to sort by shape, right? So they would drag that star to that star. There were instances, particularly in the autistic bilingual group or even in the autistic group in general, where children would do this first before dragging it. This is extra reaction time. This is more time taken to actually sort. So that was actually um, something that came up quite a lot in the autistic group and we actually did like practice trials before that tell them, no, you need, you need to do this as quickly as possible. So you just drag this down here, and sometimes they would just, first of all, like play around with it and then sort at the end of the day. So that data is actually pretty, I mean, it's, it was still first, um, it was transformed because initially that data wasn't, you know, normally c c distributed. So we had to transform it first, but in terms of the results, that is what I believe explains that in terms of the differences that they had. So some children were just going on and on and on until they sorted finally by either shape or color. And it just really increased things like the, the reaction time. Because at the end of the day, the switch cost is the mean reaction time difference from your post-switch trials to your pre-switch trials. And so just like a quick follow-up. Yes. And I, did, I do notice that it is, of course, a much larger variation as well for the bilingual kids. Yes than yes. it is for the monolingual autistic kid. Yeah, so for example, in this case, in the autistic bilingual group, so it seems that that particular group not necessarily has anything to do with bilingualism because we didn't find any language differences, but I would just say maybe like, maybe the kind of the majority of the children who need, who, who kind of like took more time to actually sort fell into the bilingual group, um, but because there are no language differences between them, we couldn't really, so at the end of the day, they actually performed 
equivalently, if there are no significant findings, it means that you did the same in terms of the performance. Good eye and good question. Bilingualism isn't necessarily a choice that will work for every child. So at the end of the day, we just want to say, no evidence supporting these concerns or policy decisions or you discouraging children with autism to take on language, uh, sorry, to not take on language. But at the end of the day, it is we want to leave it up to family dynamics and cultural preferences and the language ability of the children. So those things combined should be what de determines a decision moving forward um, and not any kind of like myths or common sense um, norms. Autism looks very different from person to person and this result is only within our group. Yes, it does match other groups that have done, um, sorry, other different like studies that have worked on this interface, but they've all looked at more cognitively able children. So what would happen or what could we find if we looked at differently abled children with autism in different language contexts? So we're bound to find something different there or maybe something the same. Mm -hmm.